Jones. Thank you. It's uh, certainly great to be back here in Indianapolis. The last time I was in this stadium, I got to enjoy a, a national championship with uh, some of my former players there at Georgia, and it's, it's refreshing to be here. You know, two and a half years from that moment, uh, it's been so rewarding to be a part of, of our program at Oregon. I'm certainly excited about that. I want to start by thanking our commissioner, um, Tony Petiti. I, I, I've been so impressed sitting in these Big Ten meetings early as a newcomer, not only with you know his vision of the conference, but his ability to listen and work with our coaches and extremely impressed with the coaches that I get to sit alongside. You know, every one of us is very competitive, but I'll say, you know, what's impressive about that room is how much these guys care about people and how much they care about the, the game. Um, and their leadership is certainly shows up in this conference and something we're grateful to be a part, a part of. I also want to take some time to thank uh, Craig Bull and the job that he does with AFCA advocating for our coaches. You know, he's been really instrumental in some of the legislation that's passed that's going to improve our game and uh, grateful we have a voice there that's listening to us uh, and respects it. This summer has been absolutely bittersweet for me. I got to you know, spend some great time with my family. We went back and spent some time in Missouri. Uh, got to explore a lot of places here on the West Coast, the Pacific Northwest, um, and it's just absolutely beautiful country. I'm really excited for everybody in the Big Ten, the fans, to get to experience some of the beauty that exists here in Oregon. Uh, I'm certainly grateful for that time. Our three boys right now are back home uh, doing church camp, but my kids are just at that perfect age. You know, 14, 13, 11, I wish I could freeze time. Some of you parents out there know how valuable that is, but I've got a uh, unbelievable home. I got a head coach at home, Sophia, my wife, that's been uh, the absolute, you know, backstop the route for our, for our family uh, and made this summer a whole lot of fun for us to spend some time together uh, in fellowship. Uh, I think she's ready to send me back to work, so it's good that football season's here. Um, these past three days, we just wrapped up a coaches retreat in Central Oregon, another beautiful area. We spent some time going over you know, future opponents, some summer scouting, and really leaning in on one of the most important traits in our program, which is connection. Uh, focusing in on you know, the roots of our program, what makes us a, an elite coaching staff, how we can build our roster, uh, what, what uh, things are going to be in front of us in our future, uh, and also just an, an opportunity to fellowship uh, and spend time together. It's a staff that I really enjoy you know, being a part of. We have some newcomers on our staff. I'm excited to see them grow. Uh, within our program, but uh, certainly value that time and the beauty of our state over the last few days. Um, but also this summer we experienced you know, great sorrow and uh, losing a player that means so much to us had finished his career here at Oregon. You know, losing Kyrie in a car accident this summer was, it hurt. You know, that's one of those things you wake up as a coach and you hope to never see. Uh, and I'm feeling for him and his family. Um, I want to I give a special thank you to the Minnesota Vikings and the way that they've taken care of Kyrie and his family and somebody that we certainly want to su support. Um, he's a guy that I always tell myself we have to be grateful for the time that we got to spend with Kyrie because uh, that's something that was really, really tough on our team and tough to see a guy that had such a bright future, um, you know, and his life being cut short. You know, this, this season is a very exciting one for our team. Our players have been working their tails off uh, this summer. And entering this conference, there's some new challenges that are presented. Going through those summer scouting reports, you realize some of these teams that we're going to get to play, uh, and it's really exciting. Um, but I'll tell you, here at Oregon, we chase and attack those challenges. We're excited about the uh, traditions that exist here in the Big Ten. Uh, we're excited about some of the venues that we're going to get the opportunity to play in, but we know that none of that really matters until you start with game one. Um, this this offseason, uh, off season, we spent some time studying a couple books that hopefully will give us an edge. We uh, studied The Art of War by Sun Tzu. We also studied the book Hidden Potential by Adam Grant. Um, hopefully those are some, some books that we can kind of lean into this season and give us an edge uh, as we attack this, this future season. I'm also really proud of the growth our team has had off the field and the impact they've made on their community. You know, our guys do a lot of projects in community service, you know, working from, with kids sports, making 230 beds with Sleep in Heavenly Peace for kids that don't have beds. Uh, you know, traveling the world, uh, really making an impact. And I'm, I'm really proud of the uh, community service that our guys do uh, and how they've been able to impact our program and our community because these guys are so much more than just football players. You know, one of the, the more enjoyable things for me being at Oregon is my opportunity to connect with some of the other phenomenal coaches at Oregon. 
you know, whether that's Dana, uh, whether that's Casey Martin, you know, the guys that we have. And it's also been really refreshing to see some of our players uh, get the opportunity to cross over in sports, you know, seeing Bryce Betcher get to go play for Coach Waz there, win a Golden Glove in baseball, but still be a great performer for us on the football field. Rod Pleasant run track. Um, that's been something I really enjoy, and I think sports at Oregon are in a great place, and that's you know great credit to our leadership, Rob Mullins, uh, and just the alignment from from top to bottom. Uh, I'm excited this today to have three phenomenal players here that are uh, here to represent us, and all three have worked extremely hard and are certainly deserving. They put themselves in position uh, to be here. I'll start with Dylan Gabriel, our quarterback. He's part of a great family. You know, Garrett and Dory have done an unbelievable job raising this guy. Um, I got the opportunity to recruit him a little bit when I was at Georgia before uh, and getting to reconnect with him. You know, obviously he's a legacy. His dad set a lot of records as a quarterback before, and now Dylan gets an opportunity to carry on that legacy. I know wearing the number eight uh, and representing the number that Marcus wore here at Oregon means a lot to him. What's maybe impressed me the most with Dylan is his ability to connect with people, not just in our program, but outside of our program, whether that's taking an offensive retreat uh, and taking our players to different parts of Oregon to, to throw the ball around and fellowship, or it's you know having the managers over to his house to watch a fight or eat a meal. Um, he's really done a great job of connecting quickly. I'm excited about the experience that he brings to the position. And I know that you guys will enjoy getting to visit with him today. Also excited to have one of our, uh, our, our greats, uh, one of our best players, Terrence Ferguson here, tied in, a guy that you know, certainly had a decision after the season whether he wanted to return or not or have the opportunity to go on to the NFL. I have to give a little shout out to Terrence. He just uh, was engaged, so he is a, he is a fiance. I'm certainly excited for him and his future there. The job he has done this offseason, the work that he's put in, the leadership role that he provides for that tight end room, but for our offense and our team has been amazing. Those of you that haven't got the opportunity to be around Terrence, you know, one of the things that I really love about him is when we go out the practice field and his foot steps inside that white line, he's running. He attacks every day with vigor. Um, he's been a, a great teammate to our team and done a great job, plays with great passion and energy, um, but certainly excited about him. And uh, his parents, Cody and Don, have done an unbelievable job and fight for every moment they can to spend around him. So uh, great to have him here. On the defensive side of the ball, we were able to bring uh, Jeff Bassa here, you know, one of our linebackers that you know, has a little bit of experience with these media days, was able to travel this last year uh, to our media day in, in Las Vegas. Um, his mom, Giselle, I know is extremely proud of him and the job that he's done. This guy has grown and grown every single year that I've been here into this leadership role to now to the point where we have a coach on the field. Uh, if, if we had to have Jeff call the, call the defense, he could tell you why. Uh, he's calling it and what he's doing. He's the kind of guy that can run the drills. Uh, if, it, if a coach isn't present, uh, he's a true leader. Uh, he wants to attack his game. He doesn't want you to tell him all the things he's great at. He wants to be coached. And then he coaches the guys around him. He demands excellence. Uh, and I think you'll see that well represented today. You know, ultimately, what should the Big Ten know about Oregon? That we're mighty different. Mighty different in a lot of ways. You look out there in the pond, you'll see a big old duck. I'm hoping we get to travel that duck to all of our away games this year. Right? We're mighty different when it comes to the jerseys you might see us wear or the facilities that we get to be in, and we're innovative. And we've always been on the cutting edge of everything we do. We certainly position ourselves to be on the cutting edge, and we're grateful for the opportunity to compete in the Big Ten. Uh, excited about this opportunity in front of us and excited to see what, what this team does. It's a, it's a brand new team. It's not the same new, uh, team as last year. You know, uh, on our team right now, there's 10 players that were on this team when I first got here, so you're talking about a new group. And uh, these guys have completely bought in. Excited to see them perform. I know they're anxious to get on the field, but there's a lot of work between now and then before we do that. But to value your time, we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Thank you, Coach. We have our first row on the right here. Hey, Coach Landing, uh, Nick Hamilton, Nightcast Media. Uh, first of all, welcome to the Big Ten. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask you just about um, Dylan Gabriel and how you were able to build and cultivate that relationship between you two that will be able ultimately to translate on the field and accomplish the goals that you all are setting out this season. Yeah, one of our DNA traits is connection. And, you know, before you, you lean on prior experience, you know, like I said, Dylan's a guy that I knew before uh, in, the, in the recruiting process and got to watch him from a distance. You know, being from Hawaii, I think it means a lot to him to be able to represent Oregon and our strong history uh, there in the state, you know, again, I heard his mom singing karaoke at Georgia a few years ago when we were recruiting him, and now she came out and killed it again here at Oregon. Um, but just an unbelievable family. 
we're spending a lot of time with each other. We got the opportunity to go. Uh, I'm not a good golfer, but Dylan and I got to go play the other day. We saw Marcus on the golf course, uh, and he's a good competitor. But those moments, right, those moments away from football where we get an opportunity to connect, uh, spend some time with each other, um, and then seeing him carry those same moments over to our players, whether it's going out to, to dinner with a guy, seeing the way he operates in our locker room, um, really has a passion for the game and, and a passion to be great, and it's excited to have that on our team. We've got a question on the far right. Dan, over here. Um, after you left the Pac-12, where do you see the advantages of coming into the Big Ten, not only for the University of Oregon, but for your football team? Yeah, there's, a, there's several things. You know, one, just having a clear vision of our future. You know, obviously this is a, the premier, you know, league in, in college football and getting to be a part of that, uh, getting to be a part of some of those story traditions, play some of the teams um, that are in our future. I'm, you know, I'm really excited about going to some venues that we haven't experienced. It also gives us an opportunity. We've always been a team that's recruited nationally, but it's certainly made our footprint stronger here in the Midwest, whether it's, uh, you know, states here in this area that we haven't tapped into as much. It gives us the opportunity to recruit those states uh, and give people an opportunity. We've always recruited, you know, East Coast to West Coast, but now having the opportunity to have some of those games played in venues that are close to the players that we're recruiting certainly helps. Let's go over here. Hey, Coach. Will, LA Football Network. Uh, you guys had the tough challenge of replacing Kenny Dillingham last year, but it didn't look so tough with Will Stein coming in. You guys were number two in total offense last year. What makes him a shooting star within the coaching ranks, and how is he meshing with Dylan in the spring and summer portions? Yeah, I've been so um, fortunate to be able to have great coaches on our staff, and Will would tell you that uh, you know one of the things that makes Will so unique is his ability to work with the guys that he has in that room, and he would tell you each one of those coaches are so valuable to his success. Uh, I think he's adaptable. I think that's the most important trait in college football right now for coaches is their ability to adapt to ever-changing rules, ever-changing schemes. I think he's hungry to learn, You know, has a passion to find information, uh, doesn't always feel like he has all the answers, but I can tell you Will knows how to solve it. And uh, he has a great group of coaches that he gets to work with every day. He's done a great job with our, our players. He connects to them. He can meet them at, their, at the surface level. Uh, as a guy that played the quarterback position, I think that's really important, um, how that translates to his success on the field. And i um, really excited to see the things that he does for our program this year. Third row on your far right. Spencer McLaughlin, Locked On Podcast Network. Coach, you lost four defensive linemen on the interior from last year's team, including Brandon Dorless. What do you see in that room, and how do you think that depth chart plays out as we head towards the season? Yeah, I'm really uh, proud of the way our personnel department and coaching staff went and attacked that. You know, we've brought, um, we've, we've recruited really well in that area, uh, especially in the high school ranks, and that's where we build our team first. You know, I think we signed 25 high school players this past year, um, but that's a position that takes development, and you have to get them caught up quick. We're able to bring in some guys in the portal uh, and then grow the guys that we have on our roster there that I think will provide us a really strong two deep that can compete. You know, winning football, a lot of people have asked me, What's different about going to the Big Ten? I hear it's more physical. The reality of winning football when you're a team like Oregon in the position you want to put yourself at the end of the year, you got to you got to win in the trenches at the end of the year, uh, not just in the middle of the year, right? And for us to build the team that we want, we know that's really important. That's why we've attacked it so hard. Coach Dan Lanning, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's exciting to be back here. I want to thank Commissioner Petiti for his leadership. Uh, he's really done an amazing job in a short amount of time uh, from us head coaches. We just want to say thank you to him for his leadership. Uh, Media Day always kicks off the, the season, so it's exciting to be back here. I never take that for granted as a head football coach and how fluid our profession is. I want to thank my wife, Heather, and our kids, Gavin Carter, Paisley, and Har Harper, for their uh, unwavering support. As always, uh, we spend a lot of time away from our families and, and raise other people's kids as well, so just want to say thanks to them. I want to thank President Ettinger, uh, who we had as our interim president for two years, who did a tremendous job leading our institution and uh, everything that goes along with that. I want to thank our Board of Regents, and I want to welcome our new president who's coming to us by the way of University of Michigan, Dr. Rebecca Cunningham, as she enters her first season, uh, as uh, first year as our university president. And I, I obviously want to thank our fans. Uh, I think we have the best fans in college football. They do a great job supporting us and our student athletes, as, especially as you're getting into this NIL world. So I want to thank them. Uh, there's one person I really want to thank, and that's our athletic director, Mark Coyle. I, I work for the best boss uh, in the business. Uh, we have a very special relationship. I, I think that's well documented. Um, in fact, our eight years now, going on eight years, is the longest tenured head coach AD relationship uh, in the Big Ten, which I think, again, shows the fluidity uh, of our profession as a head coach 
and as the athletic director. But this is what I meant when I said in my open introductory press conferences, we're going to bring cultural sustainability uh, back to Minnesota. You look at all the successful coaches that have been in Minnesota a long period of time, and they all had sustainability over a long period of time with the same culture. And, and we're doing everything we can to keep that cultural sus sustainability in place. And so with, with Coil and I seven years being together, it's, it's pretty amazing. That's it's 50 wins. We've had 16 NFL draft picks. We've had nine academic All-Americans. We have a 3.21 cumulative GPA. We've had six All-Americans. And uh, we're 5-0 and oh in bowl games in our, our seven years. Uh, we're one of only 13 teams that have had somebody drafted in the first and second round in the last five NFL drafts. Uh, Antoine Winfield Jr., Rashad Bateman, Boye Mafe, John Michael Schmitz, and Tyler Newbin. And again, I say that because that's a credit to Mark Coyle's leadership and direction of our athletic department uh, and uh, our football program because we both truly love Minnesota. And I think in, in 2024, it's okay to love where you're at. Like, it is okay to love Minnesota. It's okay to love the position that you're in. And uh, I think we share that. Uh, actually, we're actually building a house that's finally finishing uh, after two and a half years. And, and uh, we're moving in in two weeks, which is great timing for a football coach to be moving his house. So I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. you got to ask Heather because uh, I probably won't be around to, do, to pull my weight on that one. Uh, but we both believe in the student-athlete experience. And uh, I love that about working uh, for Mark Coyle. So as we transition into this new world of college football, uh, I just wanted to say something about our program that, you know, we are a transformational program, academically, athletically, socially, spiritually, the whole life program. But our world has changed in this transactional world with the NIL, with the portal, with salary caps, with obviously uh, uh, conference expansions, um, new TV deals. But really the university experience is still there. And I think a lot of people think the transactional piece, now we all have to change into just the transactional piece. We don't believe in that. Uh, we believe in having the transactional piece as a piece that allows our student athletes to benefit, but you still get this transformational life program. And I think that's really important to talk about because we're still educators, we're teachers, and we're mentors. And that'll never go away as we continue to move forward. Fit is more important now than it's ever been. We talk about recruiting. I mean, we just had the highest ranked recruiting class we've had at Minnesota. And it wasn't because maybe we were the highest bidder. It's because we had the right fit for our program. I think Michigan proved this last year, team, team, team. You build the best team, you got a chance to win. Because it's one thing to have the transaction, but then you've got to transform them into the best team they possibly can be. And I feel like we do a pretty good job of that in the selection world I'm not for everybody. I think I've said that numerous times. I don't want to be for everybody, and I don't think anybody's for everybody. But if you can find the right people that fit you, I think in the new world of college athletics and football, you can have a lot of success. So uh, I'm really, really excited uh, about where our team's at. I think they've worked really, really hard. Uh, I'm excited about the future of college football uh, and our football team in 2024. So 2024 football team, the reason I love them so much is they love ball. Like, this team loves football. And with all the transactional pieces, do you still love football? This team truly does. We focused on one word in the offseason for us, and, and, and that was competition. And I know that's pretty generic and cliche, but we broke it down into three aspects. Because I think to be the ultimate competitor, you have to understand how to compete. One, you have to compete within yourself. The within piece is critical. This is winter conditioning. Uh, this is summer conditioning. This is you versus you. And you've got to understand that's how you grow the most. Two, you've got to compete with each other. You're on the same team, spring ball, training camp. We're on the same team. We're not beating each other. And that makes you even more competitive. And those two things, with and within, get you ready to compete against the teams that you're going to face here in the season. And I think our team is getting ready to play against teams as we continue to compete with and within ourselves and our football team. We hired two new coordinators in the offseason. I'd go through all of our new coaching hires, but everybody's a coach now. So uh, we would take forever, and that would take all my time talking about all the people we've hired. So the two new coordinators we have, Corey Heatherman, came to us by the way of Rutgers. I think it's documented uh, with Coach Giano and I, the respect I have for him and what he's done. Joe harris Symbiak used to be on our staff, is over at Rutgers now. So we kept that hire within the family. Uh, Corey was an instant fit, though. You talk about a football coach. I mean, this guy eat, breathes, and sleeps football. 
really intelligent. Our players really fell in love with him the minute he got in there, and he was all ball. And uh, he's done a great job so far. And then our second hire in the coordinating aspect was Bob Ligashevsky uh, as our special teams coordinator. Uh, Bob and I go back to Tampa Bay. We were both coached in the NFL. He was our special teams coordinator. I was the wide receiver coach for the Buccaneers. He just brings a wealth of knowledge, uh, college, NFL experience, and uh, really, really excited to have him. I mean, the guy's above 60, I'll just say that. Still runs 10 miles a day. I mean, his energy is endless. So well, when we transition a little bit into our players, we've added 13 transfers. We had 25 high school players join us. Uh, we had the highest ranked recruiting class uh, since we've been there. And then I think the biggest glaring statistic for us was we have 16 of 17 eligible returning starters back this year. And I think that's a credit to our culture, our sustainability, and guys wanting to be at the University of Minnesota. Uh, guys like Daniel Jackson, who's second team all Big Ten wide receiver. Ariante Ursary, who's our starting left tackle, who's getting a lot more notoriety. One of the notorieties, he's a top 25 player in the, ESP, or the uh, EA Sports college football game. Bet you didn't know that. Not only that, if you take him and you move him to tight end, it's a hack. He's a 99. There's some information for you. Okay. Um, also, Quinn Carroll, uh, one of our offensive linemen who's also Big Ten. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Ja Joyner led us with seven and a half sacks last year. He hopes to double that. He's really had a tremendous offseason. Justin Wally, all he does at corner is seem to make plays in rivalry games. And then Danny Strigow, our rush end, who's also big, all Big Ten. But we brought four guys with us, and these guys are all elite young men. We talk to our players all the time about be a better person than you are a player because you'll make yourself a better player if you're a better person, and these guys truly, truly represent that. Um, we brought Max Brosmer, our quarterback, who's a transfer from New Hampshire, Darius Taylor, our running back uh, from Detroit, Michigan, and then Cody Lindenberg our linebacker from Anoka, Minnesota, and then our kicker, Dragon Kesich. And uh, he's really our, our social media liaison. That's how we were able to bring four. We have three, and Dragon is our social media liaison. But the best interview you'll ever have is to do an interview with Dragon Kesich. And I tell you, it'll, 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 it'll get some clicks, I promise. Starting to talk about Max real quick. Uh, Max was a 2023 uh, Walter Payton finalist, a quarterback at New Hampshire. Did a tremendous job there. Our quarterback situation was different than a lot of others. We were going to take a portal quarterback to come in and start and play right away. Somebody had to come in and engulf the program, fit the culture, want to be there for all the right reasons. Because I think a lot of people want that. But when you're in that role, it's really difficult when you actually get there and who really wants that. Uh, he's a meticulous why seeker. And he's a very curious, curious individual. And anytime you have a curious leader, you can accomplish a lot. The, the slogan or the, the quote that he's a coach on the field gets thrown around a lot, but he truly is. This guy's he could be a doctor and a surgeon, which he probably will be, but he'll be a phenomenal coach if he decides that one day after he's done playing. Uh, Darius Taylor, who uh, our running back, who I think arguably had one of the better seasons uh, at running back, but he just didn't play a lot. And I think in the offseason, Darius spent a lot of time on getting to know his body, working with our sports science team, our nutritionists, our dietitians, our strength staff, our trainers, uh, to make sure that he has a really healthy 2024 and do everything he possibly can. Um, we connected him with some other people in the transfer portal uh, at the running back position, and JoJo Newbins had a great offseason. But you talk about a terrific person who took generational trauma and made that positive change. That's what Darius is all about. Uh, Cody Lindenberg, uh, I think one of the best linebackers in the Big Ten. Again, we were hit with the injury bug last year and, and only played in a few games last year, but he's the heartbeat of our defense. He's everything to our defense. He, he, he's the voice. He's the reason. He gets everybody aligned. We're really excited to have a healthy Cody Lindenberg in, in 2024. And last but not least, uh, Dragon Kesich, who's here. I told you he's our social media liaison. Uh, he's the reigning Big Ten kicker of the year. And that's a great accomplishment. We were talking last night at St. Elmo's about that. We we're like, that's a great accomplishment. However, if you have the Big Ten kicker of the year, you're probably not very good on offense, right? That's just part of it because you're kicking way too many field goals. And I think that was uh, where we were last year. But he's got a huge leg. Uh, I hope you all get a chance to spend just a little bit uh, with him because he is a very, very, very unique individual. So uh, really excited about the 2024 season. We've got a great group of kids here. Again, uh, really excited about our transformational program. And with that, we'll open up for questions. Coach, we got first row on your far right. Oh, my far right. Okay. Uh, Kenneth Barry, Chess Sounds and Tangents. Hi, Kenneth. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Uh, Coach, you talked about obviously everything you've accomplished at Minnesota. 
in regards to just dominating recruiting in the state of Minnesota, because a lot of great players have come from there, how do you, in this phase, you know, lock down the best players in the state to keep them there? And when you look back on how far you've come as a coach, uh, what are you most proud of? Yeah, I think the, your question in recruiting is it's a great question. It's a valid question. That was something that we talked about at the beginning when we got here, that we wanted to, to really recruit Minnesota at a really high level. Uh, and I think we've done that. Uh, last year, we had the number one player in the state of Minnesota, number one player in the state of Wisconsin, and the number one player in the state of North Dakota, all committed to the Gophers. And not only that, if you look two years out right now, in 2026, the number one and two player in the state of Minnesota is already committed to Minnesota. So we take that really seriously, and I think to do that, you have to be there a long time. Right? And I think when you talk about what we're most proud of is the relationships we formed uh, within our walls. Uh, we talk about the type of players that continue to come back to us uh, through spring and be around. Uh, that takes time. When you, before we got there, I think we had seven head coaches in 14 or 15 years. And so it's really hard to be able to attach to something when you're an alum. Now our guys come back. They're there all the time. They want to be around spring practice. They come there and work out in the summer. I'm just really proud of the progress our guys are making and then watching them accomplish their dreams. Right? Not just in the National Football League. I'll give you a name, Preston Jellin, who's, who's in med school right now working to be an orthopedic surgeon. Or I can talk about the lawyers or the doctors or, or, or the teachers that we're producing out of our program, and that's still a university setting. This is still education and teaching and transformation. We brought the transaction piece, and rightfully so for our student athletes. That is awesome. But that transformational piece, I think that's what we're most proud of, is we're truly transforming lives as teachers, educators, and mentors. In the back, Coach, on your slight left. Good morning, PJ. Hi, Ryan. Ryan Burns, 24-7 Sports. We often talk about how the identity of a team can change from year to year. From what you've seen since January, what is this 2024 team's identity? Well, I think uh, for us, I, they're incredibly competitive. It kind of goes back to that word. But if we're talking schematic piece, you know, consistency is the truest measure uh, of performance. And I think last year, we weren't very consistent in anything. And we were talking on the offensive side of the ball. So the whole focus was to, to, to be incredibly consistent uh, on both sides of the ball and what we did and all the fundamentals and techniques. Um, you know, we go back to even our pass game. I, I know it's been well documented in our state that, like, we didn't have much of a pass game last year. When, when you're going through a season, you're listening to what your players can do. You're, you're listening with your eyes, your ears, you're watching what they can do. And if you're not adapting to what they're showing you, then you're just going to continue to do the same thing, and you're not going to be very successful. So what we had to do was adapt to new people at different positions, what we were good at, what we weren't, maybe what we were good in training camp when we lost certain people. We weren't very good after that in certain areas. But even the past game, if you go back, I mean, Daniel Jackson, he might be one of the – we've had four of the top ten receivers, I think, in the University of Minnesota. So when we're talking about even the past game – we want that to be way better. We want to be way more balanced. But we also have to be able to have the personnel to do that, which I think we have. We're deeper at wide out. We're deeper at tight end. We've got basically our whole line coming back. We've got a really good quarterback who's really consistent. And then, like I said, we've got, we've got a running back room that's really deep. And if we can stay healthy, we can be balanced and be consistent on a daily basis on the offensive side of the ball. The special teams one, we'd love to be able to create more explosive plays. And that's part of hiring Bob Ligaszewski. And then in defense, Corey Heatherman, I know that he's fired up to be able to make the defense his own. So, uh, but this identity is they do love football. That's an identity. And we want them to be incredibly consistent and competitive. And if we do that, we'll have a really good ball team in 2024. Coach P.J. Fleck, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Roll the boat, Sky Imago Gophers. Sure, first of all, uh, appreciate you guys hanging in there. Uh, as we like to say, we're head but the finish, we, you, the last day. I also want to thank uh, our SEC guys and some of the other guys that showed up without a tie. You know, going last and near the end, it gave me the ability to, to come in and, and have an open collar, which, which I enjoy having. Um, it's funny because as I walk to fly here, Jordan Phillips uh, said, Coach, look at you, man. You look, you're looking sweet. I said, you know what, I'm comfortable and I'm confident. Uh, and that's funny because that kind of defines the 2024 iteration of the Maryland football family, a comfortable and confident team and not comfortable as if we think we've arrived, but comfortable in knowing who we are. 
Um, I'm in year six here at, the, at Maryland, and uh, to know who you are and to understand what it takes uh, to, to get to where we can compete for championships, our players have uh, embraced that. Um, you know, I also come to you humbly because uh, as funny as it's an election year, and I was just elected, uh, newly elected mayor of Terpsville. And so I'm excited to, to serve Terpsville this season. And, you know, but when you think of Maryland and, and what we've navigated since I took over in 2019, uh, we've, uh, we've navigated some enormous change in the college landscape. We dealt with the pandemic. We dealt with the NIL transfer portal stuff, and then we dealt with conference realignment. And, and I can tell you, when you have big changes like we faced in, in, in college athletics the last few years, it creates angst, it creates anxiety, it could be frustrating. But for us at Maryland, uh, we see it as a great opportunity. Um, when you look at how we've been able to navigate it, uh, it starts with the three pillars that we kind of use it from a vision standpoint. Um, you know, in, in our alignment, it starts with our president, Daryl Pines, um, who came in the same year I did, Damon Evans, my athletic director. Uh, that alignment we have, we've all had to navigate a, a changing world to get in the respective rooms that we're in. And I think that starts with the first pillar for us is uh, we operate out of an expanded room now. And when you expand the room, you open up the doors for new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things. And I, when I think of the Big Ten now and with the addition of the four new teams, we've expanded the room there as well. So it's not just a diversity thing. It's, a, it's about bringing in different ideas, different ways, different regions. And with the addition of those four teams and uh, the way we set ourselves up at Maryland, we've been able to navigate these things at a, at a really high level to the point where we have consistently become a team that people know uh, has an opportunity to win. Uh, we embrace this opportunity uh, with expanding that room. Uh, when it brings these new ideas, it also gives us an opportunity uh, with the second pillar for us is, is giving to the community. Um, over the last season in itself, our players have done over 700 hours of community service. And we feel like uh, when you're being of service to your team and to your community, uh, it makes it a lot easier to develop a winning culture uh, because you understand here as a Maryland football player that nothing is going to be given to us. Uh, we're going to have to earn or take everything that we get. Uh, we're here now to, because of this, uh, we're here to challenge status quo. You know, when you look at the, the lack of divisions in the Big Ten, it, it, it's an opportunity for places like Maryland to break down that status quo that the top of our league uh, has to be the same three or four teams. And, you know, there was a time as a coach where I was a little scared to dream big, and I want my players to hear me talk about this. Uh, you know, it's something to stand up here in front of you guys and tell you that we want to compete for a Big Ten championship. And by doing so, that allows you to hopefully compete for a national championship. And then you'll be ridiculed. You'll say you only won eight games. You don't win big games. And you know what? For a long time, I used to be uh, worried about that. And, and as I like to say, my give a crap gauge is on E. And I want my players to understand. I want them to dream big. I want my players to embrace that we are here to compete for Big Ten championships. And, and we do it by being of service, not just to ourselves, which today's society kind of leads us to, but to do it by being of service to their teammates and to the community that we want to support. And then the third pillar for, for this vision is, is being player led. I've oftentimes said that when it's a coach led team, you're a good team, but when you're player led, uh, it gives you a chance to activate leadership from within. Uh, you have accountability, you have buy-in. Uh, it means a little bit more when your friend tells you that you're not living up to the standard than when your coach tells you. Um, and, I, and I can tell you that our team has embraced those three things. All right, I know a lot of you guys are saying, what are you going to do without Leah, man? Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out myself, uh, which is why I lost my weight uh, and, and, and I got my com comfortable and uh, confident clothes on. Um, Leah left a tremendous legacy in that quarterback room. And a little known fact, he and I met every day from the start of the season until our last game at 10 o'clock at night until 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. And the work ethic and, and the way he approached playing quarterback, he left a legacy in that quarterback room. And now as we transition to becoming what I feel is a defensive-led team, 
uh, where we have the seven returning starters that are coming back and a handful of other guys that have played some really significant minutes. Um, I can tell you that, that Leah Tungavailoa played a huge role in the foundation that we're building on to compete for, for championships. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a guy that still is impacting my life and, and Coach Saban, who is retiring, obviously from football, but now working on TV. Uh, he still has a significant role and still plays a significant role as a board member for the National Coalition of Minority Football Coaches, an organization I started uh, after the pandemic. And, and Coach plays a huge role and continues to help guide and shape uh, as we navigate preparing, promoting, and producing the next level of coaches. And so uh, I wouldn't be here now as the head coach at Maryland if it wasn't for the three years I spent under Coach's tutelage. And I know my family and I wish him well in his retirement. Um, last but not least, uh, our team. I, I brought three guys here today that I think you guys are really good to enjoy uh, talking to, and they embody uh, what this new iteration of the Maryland football family looks like. Uh, you know, when you talk about a guy like Reuben Hippolyte, Reuben came back for an extra year uh, that was granted. Here's a guy that took the vision that he saw that I showed him a vision, and he jumped on board before it became a fruition. He was part of building us to the team that's won three straight bowl games that have had seven players drafted the last two years. And so with Ruben, you, you see a guy that, that had a strong belief factor. Uh, when you look at Jordan Phillips, you see a guy that has the unrelentless work ethic. There's not a guy in the country that I think will outwork Jordan Phillips. And you'll see the passion he has for the game. And then last but not least, Ty Felton, uh, a guy that shows tremendous resiliency as a player. Uh, Ty is one of those guys that has kind of waited his turn. And, and now I expect him being paired and partnered with Caden Prather to become a, 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 pro, a, a receiving core that you guys will, will come to know as we move forward. Um, last but not least, I, I want to thank uh, our supporters and all the people that have supported Maryland over the years uh, for, for giving us this opportunity in this new college landscape to make an everlasting impact on the game of college football. Uh, with that, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you, Coach. Uh, we have on your right side, first row. Uh, Kenneth Barry, Touchdown to Tangents. Coach, you talked about community. Um, in regards to just the, what you founded and the fact that the Big Ten has the most African-American coaches over almost half than any other pretty much conference in the country, what does that do for you, especially you have James Franklin, one of the longest tenure coaches, and in regards to the community in the DMV area, how have you managed to kind of lock down the top recruits in, the, in that area and keep them home at Maryland? Yeah, the two-part question. I think first, the, the one is about the 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 Big Ten and the diversity here. And I think I mentioned this in my in my opening statement that anytime you expand the room, it's a good thing. And and just imagine if everything operated like a football locker room, we would not have some of the issues we're having today. And by expanding the room with the, the diversity we have in coaching, we're given new ways of, of looking at things, uh, new ways of uh, doing things, uh, a different kind of voice or perspective. And, and that's what Maryland has been, and that's one of the values we've added when I talked about the alignment we have on our campus. Um, when you start talking about the DMV and the recruiting factor there, I can tell you um, it's one of the most fruitful areas in the country. Uh, we've built our foundation on local players. Uh, when you see a guy like a Deontay Banks, who was a low three-star recruit, get drafted in the first round, you see the DJ Moores get drafted in the first round, it shows that we, we do kind of have a, an idea of what it should look like. And now, because of the development of those types of players in our program, it's opened the door for us to start reaping the benefits with some of the top players, not just in the DMV now, but in the country with the way we've expanded the room in the Big Ten uh, to compete. On your left side, Coach, fourth row. Coach Loxley, Kayla Bradham, Sports Philanthropy Network. I was so pleased to hear about those 700 hours that your team put in. I'm curious which players and staff are leading the charge in community impact at your school? You know, the good thing is, is part of the fabric of our program is that uh, we 
we, we pay our players to go do these community service things, and they're all making an impact. I can tell you that Dante Trader, I know, is on the All States Good Works list for this season, and we've had players each year be a part of it. I was a recipient of it as a coach of that team a year ago. Um, and, and again, it's big. Uh, we're big on knowing that if you're of service to your community, uh, understanding that great things happen for you when you pay things forward. And that's what I'm doing with the coalition that I started. That's what I'm encouraging my players to do uh, in our community while they are then able to also take advantage of the opportunities that the NIL stuff has opened up for them. Far right, Coach. Uh, I'm McAfee here inside the black and gold. Uh, Coach Sox, I know you talked about the quarterback room, but on defense, uh, you guys returned seven starters, uh, added Jalen Husky. Um, just what, what are your thoughts on the defense kind of going into the season uh, with Brian Williams stepping into his third uh, year as D.C.? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. You know, if you if you study my background, my first half of my career, the first eight, nine years, I coached on defense. I played defense in college. And so, you know, now as we transition to a defensive-led team, I'm going to put my defense hat on, and, and you guys can say I'm a defensive guy too. So, you know, B-Dub and the defensive staff, Lance Thompson, James Thomas, uh, Zach Spavitz Hall, um, They've all done a tremendous job. Uh, Zar, Coach Azar is back, uh, putting together and putting our players in the best position to have success. And I mean, that's what great coaches do. They, they put their players in the best possible position. And Brian Williams has done that the, each year when you look at the way our defense has improved. And, you know, Brian's one of those guys that I know that the people are going to come knocking doors down to hire, and as he should be on anybody's list that's looking for a head coach. Um, but I'm expecting our defense to now lead us. We've had a, our, we've been an offensive led team for the last few years. We've played great defense. That's not to take away from that, and that's not to say we won't score points on offense because we've got weapons. Uh, and once we've identified the starting quarterback, I, I think you'll see the offense grow into a role where they complement each other. Coach Loxley, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you. It's great to be here in the Big Ten. Washington football is ecstatic to being a part of this conference. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to start off by just saying that um, this experience and this opportunity to be the head football coach at the University of Washington, being the first year of joining the Big Ten, is an absolute privilege. And uh, I don't take it lightly. Uh, I'm ex extremely excited about this opportunity and believe that we have a great football team that we'll be able to showcase and compete for championships year in and year out. Washington is among the elite football programs in the country. It's undisputably one of the greatest public universities academically and athletically. And I really believe that when President Kelsey made the decision to join the Big Ten, we put ourselves in a position to be an elite class and with an elite group of teams. We brought a fantastic group of three players here with us today. Uh, really proud of the guys. Uh, as I got hired in January, I started learning so much about our team and about our players and about uh, the group of guys that we were going to be able to bring here today. Uh, and three that we brought are pretty special. Uh, we brought Cam Fabiculanen, a safety that's been a part of Washington football for six years. He was recruited by Chris Peterson, coached by Jimmy Lake and Kalen DeBoer, and now uh, chose to stay for his final year and be coached by us. Uh, he's somebody that could bring unbelievable spectrum of ideas and thoughts and values to our program and believe that his leadership will help us achieve our goals. Uh, the next person I brought was Carson Bruner, uh, one of our top linebackers. Uh, Carson's established his own legacy, although he's a legacy player um, where his dad was a 14-year NFL veteran, uh, one of the greatest Washington Huskies that we've had, uh, Mark Bruner. Uh, Carson's done an incredible job since I've gotten here making sure that um, our program and what Washington football has been about for years uh, meshes together. And then I brought Jonah Coleman with us. Uh, Jonah was a running back for us at the University of Arizona. 
He was a part of our recruiting class of 2022, which I would say changed Arizona's football program. And uh, when we uh, picked up and we left to come to University of Washington, Jonah came with us. And uh, Jonah is one of uh, the best players, best running backs in college football. Uh, statistically, uh, led uh, the nation uh, in yards per carry a year ago. One of the highest graded players in pro football focus. And on top of that, just um, finished this last quarter with a 4.0 and is on the Dean's list. And really proud of Jonah uh, and the jumps that he's made as a person. We have a phenomenal coaching staff. Uh, most of the guys have coached together for years. Uh, we were able to bring 21 staff members with us from our last spot. Um, the three coaches we weren't able to bring, uh, we brought uh, two coaches from the New England Patriots and the linebacker coach from Alabama to fill out our staff. Um, the coaches we brought with us on offense have been together for four years. Uh, we've coached every game together since I've been a head coach at all five position groups. So proud of that, that those guys were a part of a 1-11 to 10-3 and three transition where we ended up finishing 11th in the country. Defensively, was able to bring John Richardson and Jason Kafusi with us, two outstanding football coaches, and then, as I said, uh, filled in with Steve Belichick, Vinny Sinceri, and Robert Bala. This group came here to University of Washington because we believe in Husky football. We believe that we have a chance and an opportunity to win championships like we have in the past. This is a program that's won two national championships. It's a program that's won 18 conference championships. And this is a program that we believe will continue on that track. Each of us expect a ton from our student athletes. Our program is built on becoming a pro, a professional in life. Our players are expected to act like pros. They're trained to be pros. They're trained to be pros by coaches who have coached in the National Football League for over 100 years. And we know that if we train them to be a professional, whether that's the NFL or a professional in life, they're going to have a fantastic rest of their time. We teach our players to always have the values of respect and accountability. Everything we do is for the University of Washington. And we say it's all about the W, the W in work, the W in winning, and the W in Washington. We take great pride in our state. Washington football has beaten Oregon the last three times we've played. We've beaten Texas the last two times we've played. We've beaten USC the last two times we've played. And we're coming off winning 25 of our last 28 games. We are proud to be Huskies. We are proud to be in the Big Ten Conference. And we feel really good about our future as the college football playoffs begin to take shape. We respect our past, but we are excited about the future. We have to build on all of that success with a brand new team, something that's never been done before in college football. We will have 46 new scholarship athletes on a team that compete in the national championship. We'll have an entire new coaching staff, an entire new training staff, an entire new strength staff, an entire new nutrition staff, and 21 of 22 new starters on August 31st. That has never been done before, and we're excited about that challenge. We have four players on our team that recorded one start, and we are now starting over, and it's a true reboot, but so is college football. It is a whole lot of new. Everything that we're dealing with now with revenue share and NIL, with all the changes in the roster size, we believe it is the perfect time to rebrand and reboot. Washington football right now is in a very unique time, and we all must work to come together as Huskies. We all must work to bring 12 Arizona football players and 36 Washington football players and the other 35 players from 12 different universities together to build this program, and we are excited about that opportunity. We are not shying away from our competition. We will take our great city and our great university everywhere in this country to find players. Recruiting is the lifeblood of our program. We are gonna build our team based on high school athletes. 
and we're going to build our team based on being one of the best recruiting staffs in America. We'll use the portal to fill in holes, but this program is about development and this program is about finding the best players in the country to help us succeed. I look forward to August 31st. I look forward to our home opener in the Big Ten Conference against Northwestern. And I certainly look forward to being in this stadium once again at some point in time in December. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Coach. we got second row on your right. Coach Lane Harrington with Stay Alive and Power 5. How you doing? Great. All right. Welcome to the Big Ten. So let's talk about your quarterback, Will Rogers, you know, who set records at Mississippi State. You know, he played under the late Mike Leach. What kind of production experience and leadership does he bring to the quarterback room? And what kind of piece would he be able to build around with the offense? Well, he has uh, 40 starts as a college football player. He's the son of a coach. Uh, he has an incredible a football mind, football acumen. Uh, he played in Coach Leach's system for three years, and then last year played in a little bit more of a pro-style system where um, they were able to um, teach him a little bit more about playing under center and playing with more tight ends. Uh, he's brought really a great leadership about him. He has a great uh, ability to communicate the game of football. And uh, what we've asked our quarterbacks to do in years past is control the line of scrimmage, and I think he'll be really good at that as well. Over here, Heather Denich with ESPN. Hello, Heather. Given the reboot and all of those eye-popping numbers you mentioned about the transition, what are realistic expectations for your team this year? Well, Heather, you know, for us, uh, I want our team to be the hardest opponent that everybody plays. Uh, I want uh, our opponents to feel like they left that game and they played two games in a row. Uh, so our expectation is that we're going to be the toughest team uh, that they play every year, every week. And then from there, we'll see, we'll let the score take care of itself. Um, we're not going to count wins and losses right now and try to figure out um, what, the, you know, what that looks like. We tell our team there is no scoreboard. We just need to go out there and play our best games and see what that looks like. On your left side, Coach, fourth row. Hey, Coach. Nick Lemkow, last word on college football. Could you talk about some of the challenges in implementing a culture at Washington in a short period of time and maybe how your staff has overcome those uh, this spring and summer? Yeah, I would say the biggest challenge, of course, is um, you're taking over a program where Coach DeBoer did such a fantastic job in a short period of time um, with a veteran team. Uh, those guys were old. We had 13 of those guys playing in the NFL right now. Um, so we had to build a culture with a bunch of guys that have never really started or played in games together that were very meaningful. And um, we had to teach them uh, what we would expect on a daily basis. And um, they've embraced it. They've worked extremely hard together. They found a way to uh, really open up their arms and um, embrace all the different type of players we brought in from all the different communities. So our culture is that. It's a culture of belonging. It's a culture of inclusiveness. And it's a, it's a culture of wanting to make sure that if we act and behave in a certain manner, that we understand that we can have a lot of fun competing. Second row on your right side. Hey, Coach. Will Decker, LA Football <clears throat> Network. Uh, you have some serious NFL lineage on your staff. Brennan Carroll, son of Pete, is your offensive coordinator. And Steve Belichick, son of Bill. Uh, on your defensive staff. I was wondering if you could tell me what impresses you about these young men that are trying to follow in their father's footsteps as coaches, and how do you form these relationships with these two young coaches as well? Well, Brennan and I have coached together in 2011 and 2012 when I was the offensive coordinator at University of Miami. He was our tight end coach. Uh, then we coached together in 2021, 2022, 2023 as our offensive line coach at Arizona. So uh, this is our sixth year together. And um, <clears throat> Brennan's a fantastic communicator. He understands the game of football extremely well. He does a fantastic job with the offensive line. And um, he's a great recruiter. <clears throat> Steve and I coached together in New England when I was coaching for the Patriots. I was the quarterback coach at that time. He was the defensive play caller and linebacker coach. Uh, so I had the utmost respect for Steve. 
Uh, I watched him work every day. I saw how good he was at his job. So to be when he became available, uh, to be able to bring him on board, I used Brennan uh, to recruit him as well. And um, we felt like we were able to put together two really good football minds. And then obviously it's such an advantage for us when Coach Belichick comes out to practice, Coach Carroll comes out to practice. You've got two of the four or five coaches of the Mount Rushmore of coaches that are completely invested in our football program, which is one of the main reasons that we say that we're going to give players the best chance to go play in the NFL. Coach Fish, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. After 42 years of coaching, it's always good to be on the roster. Stay on the roster. That's the key to the drill. So, had a great summer. I want to thank my wife, Manette, for allowing me to do what I love to do. Uh, without her, this wouldn't be possible. We're a team. I would also like to thank Pam Witten and Scott Dolson uh, for their tremendous commitment to make an IU football relevant. And Tony Petiti, who I've gotten to know, uh, for his leadership, vision, intelligence, and willingness to make tough decisions. Uh, the Big Ten Conference is a great preeminent league, has been for a long time. And the addition of the four West Coast teams uh, puts us on an exciting new trajectory. So I've got a lot of respect for every school and coach in this league. And uh, we're excited to get going. Now I can tell you, you know, normally at these things I stand up here and, and we're picked to win the league. It's just usually how it's been. I have been picked next to last twice, which we're picked 17th of an 18 team league and I get it. Just want the two times we're picked next to last, in 2022, we won the conference championship. And in 2017, we inherited an 8-45 and team and won eight in a row and played JMU the last game of the year for the conference championship. Now, I'm not into making predictions. That's just a historical fact. Okay? So, I know you guys have been waiting for me to say something crazy. That wasn't quite crazy. Uh, I think the other point I'd like to make you know, it was just three seasons ago that Indiana was a touchdown away from winning the Big Ten Conference. Three seasons ago. Now, in this day and age, you know, the Internet Society, I got to have it now. Three seasons ago seems like three decades ago. And all of a sudden, Indiana's become like an impossible job or they're irrelevant. Um, so... What I can tell you is, in this business, the margin for error is very slim. And even Indiana last season lost five one-score games. And I'm including Penn State, which was tied with two and a half minutes to go. All right? Now, our staple, places I've coached, guy I learned from, we're pretty darn good at those one-score games. So, just saying. I like our team. We have a lot of experience on our team. We have a lot of guys that have played winning football, that have good career production numbers, multiple years, and we've got a good core group of guys that are accustomed to winning and are used to winning. Now, you probably wonder how you say that, inheriting a program like this, but in this day and age in the portal, you can change things real fast. So how did we get to this point and what's the transition been like? Day one on the job, December 1st, this was three day hiring process. This happened really fast. Day one on the job, I got 10 offensive starters in the transfer portal and half my defense. Now I didn't know that, they didn't tell me that, I wouldn't have told me either. Good move there, Scott. All right. I haven't even hired, you know, you're hiring a staff, you're doing all the things a new coach got to do. Three weeks later, we got 22 new guys on our team, multiple all-conference players, two three-year starters, high-character guys. We've completely flipped the roster. Okay. 
January, you get into your winter conditioning, spring ball. Now, I've been blessed with great staff continuity. Okay, the people that are in positions of responsibility. My defensive coordinator has been with me 10 years, Bryant Haynes. Not all as a coordinator. My offensive coordinator, Mike Shanahan, nine years. My strength and conditioning coordinator, Derek Owings, going on year five or six. Okay, so th they understand the blueprint, the process, what I expect, the standard, the expectation, the accountability. And when you have that kind of continuity that, and the right kind of people in your program, student athletes, that makes for a smoother transition. So I think we definitely made very significant progress as a program. Get in the spring ball, put your offense, defense, special teams in. What you expect, your standard, your practice standards. By practice five, it felt like a normal practice. And we continued to make improvement. Then we entered the spring portal period. We had six defensive players in positions of need. All right, another offensive player, and we've had a really good summer. So, you know, I like our team. I have confidence in our team. But we're not where we need to be today. Now, the fortunate thing about that is nobody's where they need to be today because you have so many new players and so many things on the table in terms of August practice that you got to improve on in terms of consistency and performance, intangibles, player development, scheme development, so on and so forth. All right? So when I say I feel like we've made a lot of progress, I understand we got to put it on the field. We got to put it on the field. But nothing gets people excited like winning. You string together a couple wins, all of a sudden you're on national TV every week. You can't get in that stadium, all right? You become the talk of the country, all right? One of the reasons I came to Indiana is I felt like I had done this a couple times already, not on this level. But, like, you go to Elon and they're 8-45, and 45, right? And they're 2-10 and 10 the year before, picked ne next to last. The team that was picked last actually beat them, like, 48-10 to 10 last game of the year at Elon. And you put together eight wins in a row, and every one of those games went down last play. You're winning all those close games. And all of a sudden, people won't come to the stadium. Now they can't get in the stadium. So we got a lot of guys accustomed to getting the result. We're very process-oriented in terms of what we do. Control the controllables, humble and hungry, be where your feet are, no self-imposed limitations. Improve every minute, every hour, every day, every rep, one play at a time. Buy into that, okay, and just improve and see where the process takes you. Now, I've kind of had to speak a big game taking over a job like this because we had to wake some people up and create some excitement. And after all, this is the entertainment business too. So excited to be here. We have eight home games. We have a great schedule. Can't wait to get going. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. We got first row on the right side, Coach. First row on the right. Uh, Kenneth Berry, Josh Johnson Changes, Coach. You talk about recruiting and you know getting people that are fit. In regards to just NIL and maybe the, like the local community, how have they supported you in your pursuit, and how have the players kind of reached back out in that regard too? Yeah, I mean, I think that's been a real key component. Uh, things that are critical to program success. You know, I think uh, the university's anteed up. Uh, you know, it's very important to them that we get football going. And uh, there shouldn't be any, you know, limitations on what we can accomplish in football. Uh, you know, somebody asked me, how do you define success at Indiana? I was like, well, we want to be the best. I mean... You don't bring your kids up, Johnny. I want you to be fourth best. I want you to be tenth best. Bullshit. We want to be the best. So when I talk about no self-imposed limitations, that's what I'm talking about. Now, specifically to your question, you know, that number has gone up and allowed us to be very competitive and recruit good football players. 
and there's going to be further changes down the road that I think will benefit us also. And uh, that's why, you know, just one of many reasons I'm so optimistic about our future. First row, right, on the left side. Oh, there is another. Good. Coach, uh, wondering uh, about the, your father and what you learned from him at an early age. First of all, what was the, what was the most important thing you learned from your dad? in terms of either as a man or, or and, yeah. and then coaching wise, what's the first thing you learned yeah. from him? Greatest man I've ever known. Uh, blessed to be able to call him my father was a very direct man, very honest man, had a great work ethic, led by example, helped a lot of people and players in their lives, had a good heart, uh, overcame cancer. His third year as head coach at West Virginia, given his last rights twice, beat that, had to get out of football. And uh, went back to his alma mater a few years later, had an outstanding career. Never coached for him, never played, uh, well, played one year, my freshman year at West Virginia for him. Uh, he was always my biggest critic early on in my coaching career. Did not tell him that I was going to take the IUP job because I knew what he was going to say. I called him night before, said, I'm going to be announced tomorrow. You know, I was 50, I bet on myself. I was tired of being a head coach. I took a big pay cut and it worked out. I'm here today. But uh, he, the field was named after him. I threw him off the field one year <laughs> because he was being too critical. You know what I'm saying? But very complimentary of the way we played uh, at the end when I was at JMU. I learned a lot uh, in term, uh, personal things from him. Yeah. All the way in the back, Coach, on your left side. Hey, Coach Sig, Ryan Canfield with the Hoosier Network. What ultimately landed you on Curtis Rourke, and what do you need to see from him to, to get the best out of him? Yeah. You know, I've always kind of made the quarterback decision when it comes to the portal. Our last four quarterbacks have all been player of the year in the league, and they were all different, and they all had their skeptics. So we've done a great job developing quarterbacks. I felt like he was the best out there for us. He had started a lot of games. He was player of the year in the conference in 22. Won a lot of games, engineered a lot of two-minute drives, done a lot of touchdown passes, gotten him back to second and ten when put in a bad situation. So I thought he had a really good spring, a great summer. And, uh, you know, I sleep better at night knowing uh, I got a guy like that that's played that many games. Coach Signetti, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, very humbled and excited to be here to represent the great University of Michigan. Our football program, our players, our coaches, our staff, uh, what an unbelievable job by Team 144, but we're ready uh, for Team 145 to take the reins. Um, really excited to be here in Lucas Oil Stadium, uh, a place we, we look forward to trying to strive to end the regular season here. Humbly blessed to be able to hear, be here the past couple years and uh, look forward to, to working our process to continue to do the same. We're here with three outstanding young men, leaders, on and off the field for us. Bakari Page, safety. Max Bredesen, tight end fullback. And Donovan Edwards, running back. All three of these guys have made tremendous plays on the football field for us the past three years and look to do the same this year. But more importantly, elite people, elite students, and game changers off the field. Uh, Team 145 has really done a really good job up to this point and taking the necessary steps to be elite, to do all the things that we set out to do. Win the big games, beat our rivals, beat Ohio State. Win the Big Ten, go to college football playoff and win it. For us, that's something we strive to do. Tough, smart, dependable, relentless, enthusiastic, and together is how I describe our team. We're going to do everything we can to strive for perfection. Everything we, day, everything we do every day is a process, and we'll continue to strive to do that. And we'll continue to do that with contagious enthusiasm unknown to mankind. Look forward to hearing the questions. Coach, we've got first row right in front of you here. Hello, Coach. Uh, Nick going? Hamilton, Nightcast Media. Uh, wanted to just ask you, obviously, coming off a national championship, you go, you guys go from the hunted, the hunters to being the hunted. How do you adjust that mentality now that you all are the hunted to be able to achieve your goals and be able to um, go further in, uh, during the season? 
Yeah, for us, it's about getting better every day, and we're always hunting. Regardless of uh, people are coming after us, we're coming after them. So for us, we're not in the mentality of sitting back and waiting to see what goes on. We're going to attack our process. We're going to work our tails off to make sure we're doing the best things we can possible the way we know to be, be, to be successful. On your back left in the back row. Tom Crawford, press pass, Fox 47 Lansing. Sharon, appropriate question for you, offensive line, obviously a, a position of strength last year. You lose all five guys plus one. Yet this year's offensive line, a lot of high expectations. Curious to know what keeps you awake at night, what excites you the most, particularly at the tackle position. Yeah, the thing that keeps me awake at night the most is my four-year-old daughter kicking me in my back. Uh, <laughs> but besides that, you know, just making sure that our culture, that our alignment stays the same. Our players have done an outstanding job of keeping the culture, keeping the togetherness, the brotherhood. And really, it's, it's, it's an testament to them. You know, bringing in the right staff was, was a huge piece for us, bringing in the right people. Uh, Coach Newsom has done an unbelievable job mentoring and, and leading our offensive linemen. And all those players have really taken the reins. They've seen what it looks like, what it feels like what it means to practice that way for us to be really good up front. So, you know, being the head coach, obviously having the offensive line background, I'm going to take a lot of pride in making sure that line is ready to go when we hit game one. Second row on your right side, Coach. Hey, Coach, Will Decker, LA Football Network. I'm not going to ask you to name a quarterback, but I was wondering if you could tell me about Alex, Jack, and Davis and what makes them all viable options to be the starter uh, come week one. I mean, all those guys uh, have all the attributes you need to be a, a successful starting quarterback at the University of Michigan and a lot of other universities. And we're super blessed to have all those guys. Um, everybody has their own traits and their own things that make them a little different. But I think the number one thing we're looking for out of any guy that is our starting quarterback is one, that they're a playmaker, that they can make plays, uh, that they'll make, they'll make the right decision, they'll take care of the football, and that they want to win. And they'll do anything for the team to win. So really, we're going to look for those attributes and then go from there. In the back, Coach, slight left. Hi, Sharon. Bill Rabinowitz from the Columbus Dispatch. You hired Tony Alford away from Ohio State and then later Aaron Dunstan. Can you kind of talk about that process and what they bring to you guys? Yeah, I mean, talk about two outstanding individuals, people, uh, well-rounded, well-educated, well-trusted, people that, um, you know, have known Tony for a very long time and had a, a tremendous amount of respect for him and what he's done in the business. And Aaron, not as much, but heard tremendous things about her and just want great people in our program. You know, great mentors of, of young men that are going to lead our players to a great place. Uh, so that was really the, the backing behind that and uh, excited to, to watch their work as we go through the future. First row on your right side. Heather Dinich with ESPN. From the outside looking in with the coaching changes and particularly on offense, this team looks vastly different than the one that won the national title. From where you sit, how closely does your team resemble a national title contender again? Yeah, I think every year for us, Heather, our, our goal is to win that. We're not, we're not gonna sh stray away from the goal of trying to win it all every year. Um, at, when you're at Michigan, that should be your goal every single year. For our team, you know, it'll take shape in training camp and then it'll take shape in game one and game two to see where we're at. Uh, feel very confident about our team, very excited about our team. Every team is different. You know, team 142, three and four, they're all different. So excited to see where 145 is. In the far back, Coach. Sharon, Pete Nakos from On3, hope you're doing well. Great. Talking about the quarterbacks, what is the timeline of trying to prepare, for, obviously, for the season and naming a starter? Do you expect it to carry over into the season? And, and what is your ideal timeline when, when making that decision? Yeah, I think the ideal timeline is when we feel like we got the guy that's going to help us win. There's not really a date. There's not really a time. Uh, we'll have a good feel as a staff. we got really good coaches. Kirk Campbell's a phenomenal, phenomenal coach. He's going to do an outstanding job with our offense. So uh, I know he's going to make a, a great decision, and we'll be there uh, to make it together. Coach, first row on your right side. Uh, Kenneth Barry, touchdown to tangents. Coach, obviously fresh off a national title season, pretty much it's, it's all your staff now. In regards to just how you approached developing your coaches, picking your coaches, um, how, was that more difficult 
compared to, you know, having a takeover in the interim. And as one of the leading coaches and leading African-American coaches in the country, uh, what does it say to you in this conference, knowing that most of the coaches in this conference that are African-American have been leading the way? Yeah, I think as far as picking the coaches, uh, it, was a, it was a process that we really had, I really had to go through and take my time with it. And some happened a little faster than others and feel like we got the right mix, right group of people to lead our program. Number one, they had to be great people, uh, then great teachers and people that cared about our student athletes in a great way and feel like we got that in, uh, with all our staff members. And as, as far as uh, our conference again, and, and I like to thank Ward Manuel, uh, President Ono for the opportunity to be the head coach at Michigan. It's a humble blessing, first African-American head coach at Michigan, it's a blessing. And uh, you know, I think it's awesome, but it also shows that every young man, regardless of your color of your skin, wherever you're from, you can do whatever you want. You know, don't let allow don't allow people to tell you that you can't do something if you want to go do it. You know, go take the opportunity and go strive to be great. Third row on your right side, coach. Hi, coach Jonathan Rhodes, voice of college football. You've now made a change from offensive line coach and offensive coordinator to the head coach. What major adjustment are you making personally to keep the championship caliber program where it's at? I mean, the, the number one thing I did is bring in the right staff, bring in the right people around our players. Um, I've got to be a better delegator, and I think I've tried to do that as fast as I can. But for me, it's leaning on those mentors that I've had in the past, those people like Coach Harbaugh, uh, talking to him, understanding how he, you know, how he built this program and being blessed, blessed enough to be here for the last six years. Uh, it's been phenomenal for me. So for me now, it's putting my own flavor on it, uh, but not changing too much because obviously there's a lot of things that worked. But anything we can do to get better every single day, we're going to try to do. Coach Moore, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Go Blue.